Good morning, everybody. Um, really happy to, to be back here. Um, Rita, do we know about the book? Is it around yet? Or? We're going to find out. Yeah, okay. Um, but I'm really always excited to come back here. I love the Northwest. I met my wife, uh, who was not raised up here, but she's been here for many years. My good friends, the Kwans from Tacoma. Um, but Northwest College and the Lummi people, I'm really honored to be on your land, and I thank you for allowing me to, to return. I thank Justin and Northwest College for continuing to host this really incredible event um, because it really is about this man with his palm oil uh, and the rock star that he, that he was, and in his own mind, of course. Um, so I feel sandwiched by Vine, so if I don't get it right, I feel like he's going to just come down and, <laughs> and just lay into me. But you use the word fearless, uh, and I'm not much of a, when I teach, I basically walk into a classroom and I've assigned a lot of reading and we sit down and we discuss what we read. I don't lecture, I don't talk, uh, I don't use PowerPoint or machines. I just engage them. But the word fearless reminded me of a t-shirt that my wife found, which seems really very appropriate for this particular audience. Now, where, where, is this, where is this expression from? Declaration, Declaration of Independence, right? Um, and so my wife and I were talking about this, and we thought it might be a good way to open up this event. Uh, merciless, of course, has a negative connotation, but it also, also means relentless. And that's what I learned from Vine, uh, to be relentless in our pursuit of our rights, of, our, of knowledge, uh, of our relationship to our kinfolk and so on. Um, and so she found this, and I wear it frequently. Um, and uh, I just really like what it stands for. And I, I learned about that when I first studied it under Vine uh, in 19, beginning in 1980. Um, but at the same time we learned about that, we learned that two years after the Declaration was signed in 1778, the first treaty was signed, right, with the Delaware people in which the Delaware were invited to create an indigenous state and become a part of the United States, right? So we go from being merciless savages who kill everything in our wake to being invited to, be, to form an indigenous state as part of the American Republic. Um, and so what, what kind of mind would come up with such very different kind of takes? And then in 1787, of course, Congress enacts a Northwest Ordinance which contained a phrase that Vine wrote about a lot in his work. Uh, it's the phrase that, that describes um, that the United States will always observe the utmost good faith towards Native peoples. They would never take our land without our having given our consent. That they would only enact laws based in justice and humanity. And of course, they've rarely done that, right? And yet that policy is still there. That's a permanent law of the United States government. Um, and then also in 1787, what was enacted into, uh, what was assigned into law? The U.S. Constitution itself, right? Which contains the phrase, uh, the Commerce Clause, Congress shall regulate trade with foreign nations, with states, and, w and with the Indi Indian, uh, Indian tribes. We're supposed to have a commercial relationship, economic allies with the United States. Um, and so what Vine was frequently talking about was the United States' ambivalent, schizophrenic approach toward our peoples, right? They've never been able to settle upon an approach on how to deal with us. And we see that in evidence right now uh, with the problems that we've had with Cherry Point, at Standing Rock, in Lumbee, in Lumbee country with the pipeline. Um, we see that in Obama stopping the Standing Rock oil, Trump coming in and authorizing it. So there's been that constant ambivalence. So Vine's work in part was about trying to tease out and clarify and strengthen our relationship uh, to one another, to the creation, uh, and to the different governments that have set up in our, in our midst. So uh, th that's the first time I've ever used a prop uh, as an introduction, so I, <laughs> I hope that worked all right for you. Um, but I really am happy to be back here, and I really welcome and thank Rita for the invitation, and Emma for all the good work that she does here, and everything that the college is accomplishing as many of you know from Vine's uh, incredibly diverse research, writing and teaching portfolio, he was one of the most intellectually curious, and I noticed that you use that word, 
uh, human beings the world has ever known. And his curiosity spanned law, indigenous, uh, international, federal, state, religion, philosophy, theology, paleontology, political science, history, geology, education, science, anthropology, native studies, critical studies, and literary criticism, criticism even. And some areas that don't even fit into categories. Biden, in other words, had a zest for knowledge uh, that knew no boundaries. I first met him in the summer of 1975 when I rode down with uh, Larry Redshirt to meet Vine in Boulder. Um, the international movement was kicking uh, into high gear, and Larry had been in, asked by the Lakota Treaty Council to go down and ask Vine to help them write a position paper that they were going to take to Geneva. But I came to know him much better in 1979 when he invited me uh, with an unexpected call at my office in Raleigh to come to Arizona. Uh, he had just started the first master's degree program in federal Indian policy. Um, and he called me and, and I answered the phone and he said, I hear you want to come to Tucson, Mr. Wilkins. And I said, who is this? He said, it's Vine Deloria Jr. I said, are you really Vine? He said, well, who the hell do you think I would be? Of course I'm Vine Deloria. <laughs> and then when he described the program, I said, that's what I had been waiting for ever since I had graduated from college in 76. That master's program, that two years, was an intense period that really set me on the intellectual path that I've been on ever since. The first course I took from him was a PhD level course simply called Indian Treaties. And it was the most demanding and the most fantastic course I'd ever had. Beside reading tons of, of treaties, court cases, and secondary sources, we had to write three 25-page term papers, right? Not one, but three interrelated term papers. When I survived that, um, and just barely did I survive that, I felt as if I could accomplish anything. Vine was a stern taskmaster and wrote penetrating critiques uh, of each paper. I wasn't a very good writer at the time, and I still struggle with the process. But Vine's tough advice guided me to become a somewhat better writer. I still have all of his written critiques, and I occasionally reread them just to remind myself of how much he cared and how much he could teach uh, by, uh, by writing his own thoughts. Those of us who entered the program during those early years referred to ourselves as Deloria's disciples. Not because he was a holy person, he was anything but that, right? <laughs> but because we knew that if we worked hard and engaged the vast materials that he and the other faculty had prepared, that we'd be ready to take on the challenges. We would be merciless uh, in our resistance uh, to the problems that we were facing. Unlike Donald Trump, who, as one writer put it, has the rare clarity of mind of someone propelled by delusion, Vine's clarity of mind <laughs> and spirit came from his respect for the values and knowledges of natural peoples, his respect for the land, his unquenchable quest for the truth, his brutally honest character, and his impeccable integrity. And as one of the earliest and most steadfast supporters of Eastern Native peoples, including my nation, the Lumbee, Vine was someone I'd known about long before I ever met him, having read Custer Died for Your Sins and God is Red in my freshman year in 1972. Custer was the book that really sort of blew my mind open and convinced me that I needed to get out of Pembroke and start traveling to meet other Native peoples and find out what needed to be done. Ultimately, all of what Vine did in his public life was about engaging in actions and the development of legal, political, educational, and cultural strategies that were designed to improve the conditions of all Native peoples, recognize, non-recognize, treaty, non-treaty, urban or rural, mixed bloods or full bloods, and everyone else for that matter, also for the restoration of an ecological ethic that respects the earth as our actual, not our symbolic, mother, and a call for Native folk to strengthen their spiritual character, both individually and collectively. Vine was undeniably one of the most prolific Native writers in history. He authored, co-authored, edited, co-edited nearly 30 books, um, nearly 200, more than 200 articles and essays, and he delivered countless um, 
keynotes, lectures, interviews, and gave congressional testimony many, many times, several times on behalf of my tribe's quest for recognition. I had the good fortune of co-authoring two books with him, although truth be told, he was a dominant author, not surprisingly, in both of the books. The second to last book that Vine wrote before he passed, The World We Used to Live In, a great book, uh, which came out a year after he walked on in 2006, continued his tradition of providing clear advice to Native peoples about the most, um, that most important of questions, how do we relate to the natural forces of the world? And where are we going as Native peoples? Another posthumous book, a comparative analysis of Carl Jung and the Lakota people titled C.G. Jung and the Sioux Traditions came out in 2009. And his last book that I had the honor to co-write with him, The Legal Universe, came out in 2011. How remarkable is that? Mine was so prolific that he had three books come out after he died, see? <laughs> I mean, that's a writer for you, right? While Vine sometimes discounted the importance of his prodigious and original works, calling them ad hoc and spur of the moment political tracks, he also, and, had, and much more accurately noted, that if one read his scholarship uh, in the context of his life, it was possible to, quote, see a persistent effort to lay down certain kinds of strategies for political action which are consistent from start to finish and they would be alerted that it is in the actions of my life that theories and ideologies are worked out. It was always about action for him. And Mr. Dr. Kwan knows what I'm talking about there. Vine was not a fan of various iterations of sovereignty that we hear about these days, um, from intellectual sovereignty to food sovereignty to walled sovereignty or artistic sovereignty, to name but a few. Rather than spending time defining and redefining the term, he believed that we should be about the business of responsibly and pragmatically exercising our culturally based governing powers by acting with integrity and basing our decisions on sound values. In other words, virtually everything that Vine wrote about uh, provided directions, actions, and strategic plans to improve conditions for all Native peoples other oppressed groups, and for our Earth. I'd like to relate to you some of the broad reforms, policies, and realistic suggestions that Vine offered in many of his voluminous works. And my lovely wife and my friend Marilise are going to hand out um, two tables that are in the book that I'm basing this talk off of, which hopefully will arrive sometime today. Um, um, it's because what I had, uh, what I did in, in, in 2003, I think it was, Steve Pavlik and Dan Wildcat decided to put together a book of essays in honor of Vine. It's called Destroying Dogma. Um, it's a wonderful collection, uh, and they asked me to write a chapter, and I said, well, I'll write it, but what I want to do is focus on his policy ideas, his recommendations for reform, his suggestions on how to improve conditions. And the piece I wrote was called Forging a Political, Educational, and Cultural Agenda for Indian Country. And in it, I went back through many of his uh, writings, uh, testimonies, speeches, and pulled out all the recommendations I could find in the areas of politics, law, history, and government. And I divided the essay into two broad parts, recommendations for our nations and recommendations uh, for the federal government. Uh, and those, those two tables sort of lay out for you the broad uh, essence of what those recommendations are and whether or not they've been acted upon by the respective uh, communities. A few months before he passed uh, in 2005, he returned uh, the draft essay that I had sent him and said in a note, uh, he said, Wilkins, I had read your article on my way to work yesterday as I was clearing out my files it really is a major piece of scholarship and mind reading on your part. And he went on and said, it occurred to me that after I'm gone and people my age have to think in such, in such terms, that you could keep the article and update it, add a few well-chosen sentences from our correspondence and have yourself a nice quick book. Right? <laughs> Vine's sense of timing, uh, especially about publications, was always impeccable. And I always took to heart his suggestions. 
The book, uh, Red Prophet, which hopefully will arrive today, took much longer to write than I anticipated because it was difficult uh, to, to do it um, for lots of reasons. But it's finally out. Um, while others have written works that provide biographical details about his life or assess his views on education or political theory, and Vine himself wrote a wonderful detailed family genealogy that's in a book called Singing for a Spirit, a portrait of the Dakota Sioux. And there you can find the entire legacy of his ancestors back to Saswe in the mid 1800s. Little scholarship has been produced that focuses on his philosophical, political, legal, cultural, and economic recommendations for reform. My short book provides uh, at least some of that important data uh, within the context that Vine himself suggested. Along with me and Shelley's book on dismemberment um, and disenrollment, this is the most important book uh, that I've ever written, and it's the one that I feel the most personal about. In his seminal book, Custer Died for Your Sins, published in 69, Vine outlined what I call the DeLorean Trilogy, which consisted of his powerful and original discussion of tribal sovereignty, his distinctive conceptualization and defense of the doctrine of tribal self-determination, and his clear description and analysis of the sacredness of space and place as understood by our peoples. This trilogy of concepts is far more important than the so-called Marshall Trilogy that describes three important cases uh, that recognize and profoundly constrained our sovereignty land rights and powers to engage other nations. That trilogy, the Marshall Trilogy, locked us in a dependent relationship with the federal government. The DeLorean Trilogy, by contrast, lays out a framework that affirms our inherent sovereignty and strengthens and empowers us culturally, politically, and territorially. Vine's trilogy set the stage for a life of ideas reforms and suggestions that if ever fully implemented would go far towards the alleviation of what ails uh, much of us, much inside and outside Indian country. In later works, most notably in his robust study, The Metaphysics of Modern Existence, he added to his trilogy by discussing two additional terms, interdependence or interrelatedness and the simple word maturity. In fact, for Vine, maturity was probably the most important concept. As proof of this, when he was interviewed in 2000, he was asked by the interviewer, what then to an Indian is the, most, is the ultimate goal of life, Vine? And Vine responded by saying, maturity, the ability to reflect on the ordinary aspects of life and discover their real meaning. With this as a backdrop, um, I'd like to highlight a few of the recommendations that you see on the tables before you uh, and talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, some of those um, ideas. It's important to note that some of Vine's suggestions for reform have in fact been implemented or at least partially implemented at both the tribal and federal level. Ideas such as to train native judges to understand both tribal and federal law to engage in land claims restitutions for nations who unjustly lost lands, which has happened to most of our nations, right? Um, that Congress should promote native self-determination, which it did in 1975 when it en enacted the Indian Self-Determination Act. That the United States should resolve legal and moral liabilities for Indian massacres like Sand Creek um, and Wounded Knee. Um, that Congress should create block grant programs so that tribal governments could have more flexibility to spend their own monies. Uh, and this came about with the Indian Self-Governance Act in the early 1990s and the early 2000s. And that Congress should address and seek to rejuvenate our land base. Uh, Congress and the BIA have begun finally to make some progress on that front uh, through the Indian Land Consolidation Act and particularly via the Cobell class action lawsuit settlement. Uh, and since 2016, uh, dating back to 2010, about 1.5 million acres of land have been added back to our uh, tribal nations' uh, land bases. That native governments should adopt policies to clarify and structure 
what social scientists should be allowed to research. And many tribal nations now have those protocols in place, right? I know that uh, Northwest does. Um, and that native governments should hire full-time lobbyists and have them placed not only in Washington, D.C., but in every state capital. Uh, and a number of native governments now have those. And in fact, my wife found uh, a 60-page law review article just came out last week encouraging native peoples to engage in more lobbying for all the obvious reasons. And so some of Ayan's ideas have caught on and have been put into place, but many have not, as you can tell by looking at the tables. When Vine was but a lad of 19 years old gearing up for college, his initial plan was to study geological engineering. Anybody know that? Yeah, you knew that. In, a, in an application that he wrote in 1952, um, applying for John Whitney Foundational Education Grant, he wrote that his goal was to earn a degree in geological engineering because, in his words, our country needs geologists very badly. I have a very deep feeling for the land since my ancestors, the Sioux Indians, once ruled it. My ultimate purpose, he said, is to become a good geologist. Then I would like to remain in South Dakota to help build up the state, particularly the immense tracts of land held by the Indians. And Vine went on indicating that uh, the early primacy of land in his consciousness and said, quote, there are many Indian ministers, teachers, government workers, and so on, but I know that there is a great need for geologists, who is himself an Indian and naturally has a keen interest in the welfare of the Indians. For example, I know that the average Sioux Indian in South Dakota uh, has very little conception of mineral deposits, which might be underneath the very ground that he owns. I would like not only to locate such deposits, but also enlighten the owners so that they will stop selling their lands so cheaply. And this is my 19 years old thinking, right? When he was the executive director of NCAI in 19, between 1964 and 67, he had the opportunity to testify before Congress uh, on many occasions. And on one, uh, in one congressional testimony before the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights, which was gearing up to enact the Indian Civil Rights Act, Vine called on Congress to provide sufficient funding for native governments for the training of tribal judges so that they could understand judicial procedure and to build a system that balanced law and customs. And again, this shows that Vine, early in his career, was convinced that Native peoples needed to revive and draw from our own values, our own historic institutions uh, of governance, traditions, and so on, while at the same time looking to find ways to improve our relations with other governments, right? And in Custer, Vine stressed that Congress should enact a policy that would respect the inherent sovereignty and dignity of Native peoples and a, quote, cultural leave us alone agreement in spirit and in fact. And it was also in Custer Vine's best-selling book where he let Eastern natives know where he stood. He said that Congress should enact a blanket law recognizing the status and rights of all Eastern Native peoples and their rights to organize under the Indian Reorganization Act. And he also wisely added that federal services could then be made available to those long ignored nations on a contract basis that would have enabled us to eventually attain a measure of economic self-sufficiency. If Congress had enacted, acted upon that recommendation alone, the entire federal recognition process that has become a political debacle could have been uh, avoided. Instead, Congress acquiesced and allowed the BIA to establish the problematic criteria for what constitutes an Indian tribe in 1978, and the problem is so mired now in political conflicts and economic battles over gaming that there's no logical ending in sight. Custer, of course, brought him loads of attention, particularly from anthropologists and Christians, right? Two of his favorite uh, 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 people he liked to talk about. Uh, in going through his papers, I found a letter uh, from Robert Lane who was an a white anthropologist, the husband of Barbara Lane, who should be familiar to some of you Northwest tribal folks because she was the expert witness during the fishing rights wars of the 1960s and 70s. Um, and Robert Lane had been a little bit put off by some of Vine's attacks on the anthropological profession, and he wrote Vine and asked Vine about his political strategy. 
Bayan wrote him back and said, quote, I do not believe that demonstrations can carry a group of one million in a nation of 203 million very far without them getting squashed. So in a certain sense, we have to find leverage points and play with meaningless stereotypes to drive wedges into the outer walls which encompass us. The Indian issue, as I see it, is reconstituting an undifferentiated worldview which can feel comfortable with electronic technology, yet find a human social value system beyond Christian economic Darwinism. Right? Boom, yeah. <laughs> Vine then said that he and a leading non-Indian historian, who I think was Wilkham Washburn, or it could have been Alvin Gilselfi, who he said always tries to compete with me as to who is the greater Indian, <laughs> had issues that left them both wanting from the indigenous perspective. I am, said Vine, really a political poet with a contemporary Indian background, a Zionist who does not relate to the Hebrew Indian tradition except as a way to keep oppressors from the real traditionalist. Vine the poet, right? When I first read that, I just said, wow, that's just too much, man. You're, you're all right. A couple years later, in 1973, he applied to the San Francisco Theological Seminary not to join the clergy, but, quote, to continue studies in the philosophical basis of religions and religious experiences and expressions. In his application, Vine described his scholarship and stressed that his latest book, God is Read, which had just come out, or actually was due out in the fall, and he wrote that, quote, the reason I would like to undertake studies in theology at this late date is that I would like to develop a theology of nature, based upon the American Indian experiences and beliefs, which can be used to bridge the gap between peoples and between the current concern for ecology and the traditional Christian doctrines of exploitation of nature. He continued by noting that the recent Wounded Knee crisis in South Dakota, quote, if placed in the context of the Old Testament prophets, concerned with land reform would be a startling ethnological event in itself. I feel, he concluded, that a great deal of new materials from the American Indian experience could produce some theological insights for the world today that would be quite creative and unexpected. I would like to try and develop this theme. So that was an application. He didn't go for whatever reason. I don't know why he didn't. I'm sure he was probably accepted, but he, didn't, he never followed up on that. Another, ma another major issue for Vine in Indian country was a split of urban versus reservation-based um, and eastern versus western native communities, called in large part by federal policies of removal, relocation, termination, and extreme poverty. Vine pressed for the formation of native coalitions. He was always about the coalitions, Marilee, um, that would bring these separate but related groups together in a way that would have created a measure of unity, thus forcing the BIA and other federal agencies to accept their obligations to all Native peoples, regardless of geographic or jurisdictional location. One particularly brilliant idea he proposed, quote, would concentrate its attention on the coordination among the non-reservation peoples and the reservation programs on a regional or area basis. In that way, migrations to and from urban areas could be taken into account when planning reservation programs. This reeks of common sense, but we've not yet been able to make it happen. Right? In one article, he addressed what has become an intense issue for many Native peoples, the ongoing tension between those who have been generally assimilated into the broader society and those who seek to retain and practice traditional values and ceremonies. Vine always had the greatest respect for traditionalists, and it was respect that heightened over the years, and he called upon those individuals to acknowledge that, quote, the basis of Indian tribal religion is not simply preserving old social forms and ceremonies, but creating new forms and ceremonies to confront new conditions, see? And that's what's happening here and in all the other tribal colleges. This perspective Vine held was crucial given that indigenous customs and beliefs had been shaped by particular times and places, and in order to be meaningful, Religious traditions must be maintained, must he maintain, quote, relate to a dramatically changed community 
in a dramatically changed environment. See? If I knew he just couldn't go back in time, right? That's impossible. But he said there is knowledge there, and we can draw that forward and use that to move ahead. And that's why I like Rita's uh, theme for this year's conference. Right? Um, Bain believed that traditional people could understand this concept since, quote, tribal religions were not dependent upon the teachings of saviors and because truth manifests in the ever-changing experiences of the community. Right? I think this is an idea that if we could really take that to heart, we could really move ahead even with greater relentless determination. He then uttered a line that reflected his core positive belief in the inherent sovereignty of each native community. Quote, the shape of the Indian future cannot be imported either from Washington or from other struggles for social change. The major question, he said, was, quote, what shall be the true and accepted meaning of the tribe? Although it was at the time thought of as a quasi-political entity, um, and some wanted it to become a more viable economic uh, entity, um, for Vine, his hope was that the tribe might once again become identified at its core as a spiritual and religious community. So Vine knew that's what we were at our, at our core. Although Vine retired in 2000, he was anything but retiring as a thinker and writer. And when I had the opportunity to comb through his many files before they were shipped off to Yale University, in his basement, I found a short document um, that he had written simply titled Vine's Projects. Um, it laid out the work agenda that he had set for himself for the next several years. And here are some ideas for you students here, or for all, anybody, really. Um, and here he laid out um, some projects that needed to be done. The first set of assignments he intended uh, was to revive and keep working on were the traditional knowledge gatherings that he had initiated back in 1992. He had, up until that time, organized seven, dealing with plant knowledge, animals, techniques of preserving oral traditions, origins and migrations, and then a great one that he held in Evergreen, uh, Giants and Little People. Uh, anybody remember that one? That was really a cool conference, right? Um, and two on native star knowledge. The conferences were largely attended by natives, and they had been very successful, although sadly no recording devices were allowed, and consequently much of that knowledge, you know, uh, who knows where it is now, because many of those elders have passed on. Right? Uh, the next gathering he had planned was to focus on native elders and historians who were going to share their knowledge of volcanoes. He was really keen on volcanic activity, Julio. Um, and then after that, the next two gatherings were going to focus on nutrition and medicine, right? Uh, very important uh, subjects in any country with all of our dietary uh, issues. Other ideas were under consideration as well, including gatherings on the sacredness of water and how it relates to fish and plant habitats, which you all know about here, right? And a gathering on buffalo to address that animal's uh, sacred significance to indigenous peoples. He ended that section of his personal report by stating that, quote, there are many timely and important topics, and instead of seven over the past 15 years, we should be doing two of these every year, right? So we need to put our minds together collectively and think about putting some of these conferences into play. The next project that Vine wrote about or was planning to do was going to be a documentary history on Lakota treaty history that he was working on with Raymond DeMalley, who co-edited and compiled the big two-volume study on treaties that they did together back in 1999. Vine knew that there was a need to digitize and make available all the recorded treaty and agreement transcripts, biographies of prominent Lakota treaty signers, maps of the occupancy areas, court of claims documents, uh, and, and Indian Claims Commission materials and other data. He knew that such a project would have enormous educational value especially to students in tribal colleges and in high schools across the country. We could take La Lakota Treaty History, call it Lummi Treaty History, and do the same thing, right? Pull all that data out of the National Archives, out of the Washington State Archives, and bring it home. Bring it right here to your beautiful library, right? 
Another venture he planned was an oratory project that would culminate in a book featuring speeches by native speakers emphasizing the eloquence and value of traditional native oratory. As he put it, speeches at treaty meetings were particularly eloquent, and their speeches give us insight into the beliefs and expectations of the leaders when confronted with the necessity of surrendering land and then their freedom, right? Another beautiful idea. This was to be a major project that would begin with the Lakota documents, but would then expand to the record group 75, which is the National Archives record group that holds all the ratified treaty material. The final set of documents to be compiled would be those made by natives when they testified at the 10 Indian Congresses that John Collier and Felix Cohen put together as they were gearing up to get the Indian Reorganization Act adopted in 1934. The oratory project would stress the worldview of individual native speakers, highlighting and analyzing their philosophies and intents as they prepared to sign significant treaties or agreements or to express their support or disfavor for the IRA. He also planned to oversee a native student oratory contest at an Indian controlled high school or tribal college. And then lastly, and this was one that I was really surprised by, Vine also knew that children, of course, needed to be re receive more attention, and he had plans for a series of children's books that would not only be about native children, but would in fact be written and created by native children themselves. The purpose, he said, was to provide Indian children the opportunity to share their talents, worldviews, and to make learning fun. Gaining confidence in their place in society will provide the bridge to higher education outside the community. These books were to involve language skills, artistic talents, and the relay relaying of stories. And the students were to be encouraged to express traditional knowledge in the text and by using images. So those are some of his ideas that he had laid out for us, uh, or, or for himself, but now they fall upon us, right? Since we are all serious about improving the situation of each native nation and our relations with states, the federal government, and the international community, and doing more to protect and live with the environment, then it would behoove us all to spend time dwelling on and then responding to the ideas that Vine spelled out in those tables and in his other works. In the broadest sense, these powerful, timely, and interconnected suggestions to policy reforms would strengthen our nationhood, but would also fortify the notion of the U.S. as a pluralistic democracy, home to not one but many democracies and theocracies, striving to fulfill the needs of their citizens and maintain amicable relations with other political bodies. As noted, some of Vine's ideas have found their way into law, policy, and popular discourse, but it is clear that many of his suggestions have not yet been acted upon by Native nations and the state or the federal government. In assessing the current state of Native America in virtually every sphere, uh, it is striking how relevant and timely many of his suggested reforms are. The fact that we have not thus far acted upon the majority of his ideas is cause for some dismay, but that they have been proposed and retain all their potency to improve the human an environmental condition is exhilarating. And in closing, by acting upon these ideas and after having closely examined the needs of each of our citizens and each of our nations, we would then be positioned to not only have remembered the world we used to live in, but would be in a situation to create the kind of world we need to live in. We would have become once again at heart the spiritual communities our ancestors were and Vine believed we could be again. Thank you very much.